Jesus Christ, thank you for your love for us and kindness to us. Thank you for walking with us and caring for us. Help us to uh, keep in step with you as we walk. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So every mom has her funny little quirks. In my experience, dad's quirks are a little easier to find. Bad jokes, strong opinions about insignificant things, dress socks with shorts, those are dad quirks. <laughs> Mom quirks are a little easier, a little harder to look for. In my life, Susan McDonald is one of the classiest people I know. You'd be hard pressed not to find her collected, centered, and ready for everything. Needless to say, that's why my life is very much the same. One of the few quirks in my mom's life that I finally found and noticed over the years used to come when we'd leave the house. I'd get all packed up for college, all shining up for a date, and mom in house coat and slippers would run out the door and go, Do you need this? I've got this. Josh, stop. Do you need this? <laughs> a blank piece of notebook paper, a box of raisins, a jacket in the middle of August, these are the items that mom would be waving. Do you need this? Do you need this? A pair of moon boots, a roll of quarters, a hastily thrown together ham sandwich. No, mom, I do not need that. Do you need this? Do you need this? I'm just going out. I'll see you at dinner. I'm just going to work. I'll see you at quitting time. I'm just going to college. I'll see you at Christmas. Do you need this? A left-handed glove, a purple thumbtack, a roll of paper towels. No, Mom, I do not need that. And it irritated me at the time, of course, but now I miss it. And there are plenty of times in my adult life, in the weird and scary anxiety of being an adult, that I wish someone would run out and make sure my lunch was packed. Because <laughs> that is life. This is Mama's love. This is Mama's love. And that's all it was in the end. She just wanted to see us one last time. Just wanted to make that last bit of connection. Do you need this? Do you need this? Before the three of us, my brother and my sister and I, tore down the road back into our busy lives. And now I understand a little bit more that I have kids of my own. The days are very, very long. The years fly by. Mom's love. Something to reflect on on Mother's Day. When I think of my mom's love in my life, I think of her running out to bring us one last thing. This love that cut through moments. I'm on my way to prom, college, grad school, seminary. Mom! This fiercely protective love that God has built into mamas. And for mama, the kids are the main priority and the rest of the world can take a number. Mom will rock right out in the middle of whatever situation, house coat, curlers and all, if it means protecting, loving, or spending one last moment with her little ones. And I think of the time we were in a restaurant, and the lady at the table next to us told us that my kids were being too loud and they were ruining her dinner. And Heather got the crazy eye. Calm down, ma'am. Back away. Heather had a very classy reaction in which she informed this lady that Restaurants are public places, kids make noise, and there were a lot of other tables she could sit at if she'd like to. Amen. And that is what her reaction was. Could have been worse. Anyway, so is the kind of case with our passage today. We see mom's love. Mom's love slicing through cultural barriers, awkward situations for the love of her little one. And we see Jesus interacting with a mom who is desperate and appreciating this fierce love she has for her daughter. We see mom running out in her house coat and bunny slippers. We see mom saying, hey, restaurants are loud, kids are loud. A lot of other tables you can sit at if you want. Amen. One of the old theological statements that they used to say after of, about a real figure who could stand up against a lot of people was that he stood up and in Latin they'd say contra mundum. They would say Josh contra mundum or John contra mundum. Contra mundum means against the world. And so in that sense we have mom contra mundum. And that's what she does sometimes. Mark 7, verse 24 through 30. Mark 7, verse 24 through 30. I promised you guys we'd get out of John. So we did. Not very far out of John. 
Mark 7, 24 through 30. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, and yet he could not be hidden. And immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left her daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon gone. Behold, one of the most difficult passages in the Gospels. I just thought I'd do a fun one today since it's a holiday, so there you go. Let me set the scene for you. Jesus is in Tyre and Sidon, a region north of Jerusalem, and he's there during the Passover feast. So this is the time of year when everybody, especially male Jewish observant people, were on their way back to Jerusalem for the Passover. Required feast of observance for being a Jewish person. And Jesus is taking his apostles and going north. So he's going against traffic. They're all coming here. He's going that way. He's essentially up in Tyre and Sidon so that he can rest. He has been in constant ministry, constant giving, constant depletion. He is resting and recouping. In a sense, he's almost hiding. And in the middle of that, this mother finds him. We have to look at what's going on. He's staying in a house in this region. We don't know whose house it is. It's probably someone who's not Jewish. Probably someone who's a Gentile, meaning that Jewish people are not supposed to stay at his house. They don't stay at each other's houses. This is already kind of an out-of-the-box kind of situation. There's already some awkward things going on. And part of the issue here is that a woman comes right over a bunch of different barriers of culture, walks into this person's house, where Jesus is already out of place, and then she throws herself at his feet. Which is very similar to what the woman did when she wiped his feet with her hair. Yeah. Amen. And these things are very inappropriate for a woman to do in that culture. Very inappropriate for her to do that. Very embarrassing. It would have Everybody would have covered their mouths what's going on. And Jesus says the strangest words to her. And that's what makes this such a difficult passage. Jesus uses an ethnic slur to refer to her. He calls her a dog. And why in the world would Jesus say that to somebody being Jesus? And it makes it a difficult passage. So scholars are all over the map on this one. It's interesting to try to find out the best way to go with it. Trying to figure this out is one of few reliable headaches in the Gospels, and there are acres of papers written on it by seminarians and Bible students trying to show off. Don't worry, I'm not going to try to crack the whole code for you today. But it's in Scripture and therefore needs to be studied. Amen. It is included in the Word of God, even though we don't quite know where to put it. It's there. And it tells us something about God's character. That's why I put it in there. And so our title for today, Grace Crumbs, a sermon for Mother's Day. That's a picture of my mom. No. <laughs> yeah, she, would, she would hurt me if she knew I said that. So. But I want to talk to you about the three R's of this passage today. The three R's of this passage. That's much more a picture of my mom. On the phone, on the phone, on the phone. On the phone, on the phone. Oh, well, I'll be praying for you, honey. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Heather says she doesn't have any childhood memories of her mom without her ironing and on the phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, I get you. Yeah, that's Wisconsin, you know. Oh, I'm going to the game. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, we're having brats and cheese curds over here. Yeah. So anyway, there she is. The three R's. Rest, run in, and reality. Rest, run in, and reality. So first of all, rest. Rest. This is Marilyn, so... Uh, <laughs> I remember those days. Yes, 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 yes. Got those grandkids and then just adopt a few more while things are going. 
So we have to take a look at where Jesus is in Tyre and Sidon. As I said, he's throwing off convention here, going north when everyone else is going south. And he is resting. And that rest is part of things. The rest was built into the plan. He only had so many years to do what he did. He only had so much time to get it all done, and he built rest into that. It's not the first time we've run into rest as a theme in Jesus' life and a part of God's life in general. The pinnacle of creation is not the flying fish and the parrots and even mankind. The pinnacle of creation is the Sabbath, when God rested. When God rested. And I think of that in my relationship with my kids. I provide for them. I feed, clothe, shelter them. I take them to the doctor. I take them to the dentist. I take them to school. But if I do not rest with them, I do not have a relationship with them. If I don't rest with them, I'm not their father. And if I don't take time to do pointless things like building Lego towers or making mud pies, then I'm not really dad. It's that time of rest that God built into us. Rest on many different levels. The rest for most of us, most of us, I know especially for myself, rest is always tinged a little bit with guilt. I should be doing something. I should be getting something done. Why am I resting? When the real work is the rest itself. Restoration, vital to getting anywhere. I want to spend all my time with my kids that I can, but if I don't take some time for me and Heather, and if I don't take some time for just me and me and God, then I'm not giving them very much of myself at all. I'm not restoring. And we see Jesus doing that all the time. It'd be interesting just to go through and see how many times they catch him asleep or they catch him going off on his own. He went up on the mountain to pray. He probably went up on the mountain to take a nap, too. I would guess that, absolutely. So we see Jesus doing that. We see the rest of his community working hard to do their observance, identity, ritual of Passover. The whole year would have built up to that, and this is when the time that Jesus leaves and turns it all off. So rest was built in from the beginning. Rest is part of who we are. And if you've never had a kid do that with your eye, it's a particular kind of aggravating blessing. Anyway, the run-in. Even during this rest, Jesus gets found out. This woman comes and lays herself down at his feet. And again, this is wildly inappropriate. For her to be that familiar with a rabbi, a teacher in the community, was very, very inappropriate. There were certain ways you approached a rabbi, certain ways you talked to them, and she just threw it all off. She jumped across all of them because of the love and desperation she has for her daughter. Amen. And so here she is in her house coat and slippers running out to disturb everything, and Jesus' answer to her is one of the greatest riddles in the Gospels. Verse 26. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter, and he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. So what is going on here is that Jesus is using the word that Israelites used for people who are Gentile. Dog. Those people had words for the Israelites that weren't very nice either. It was going both ways, absolutely. This is not just a matter of different races that are different. There is animosity and separation between these people. And it's mostly based on their faith. And Jesus uses this word for this woman, dog. He actually uses the word for her daughter. He talks about her daughter here, and so he uses the word little dog. And there are a number of ways that people have tried to sort of smooth this over and match it up with the rest of what we know about Jesus. Now, one of the ways is to say he uses this word little dog, which means puppy. So instead of the derisive word dog, which means a mangy scavenger, what he means is something like puppy. That sort of ties it with a little bit too easy of a bow. You haven't been in the Bible very long if you think things are that easy to tie up. Amen. Sorry, Dad, I learned that from him. I don't agree with it. Anyway. The other way is on the other extreme, which I find greatly troubling theologically. This position here that Jesus 
they believe that Jesus is acting out of prejudice, that he's being pig-headed, and he's doing something wrong here, and this woman is teaching him about loving people. That's a problem with your theology. If you think Jesus is God, and that what he does is right and perfect, and we should be like him, yeah. grab one thing, you lose a lot of other things. Both of these answers are problems. Both of these answers don't take into account a very big picture. Mm -hmm. And they also try to answer too many questions. Mm -hmm. If your theology is trying to answer too many questions, pull back, pull back, pull back, pull back, pull back, pull back. Don't do that. Amen. Keep it simple. That's the rule. Yes. The fact is that Jesus uses an ethnic slur. He referred to this woman the way the rest of Israelites referred to those people. And our understanding of Jesus is that he was to take down that wall between Israel and the rest of the world. Amen. Much of the ink in the Bible is spilled saying just that. Mm -hmm. So why would Jesus use these words? Mm. And on the one hand, you have the answer that he used the word puppy. Mm -hmm. Puppy. Sorry, calling someone a dog or a little dog, mm -hmm. not that much difference there. Amen. Still a problem. Yeah. At least still a problem with me. Mm -hmm. When I call my kids a little dog, we'll have a conversation and we'll be outside. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. On the other hand, you have this idea that Jesus is learning something, and that ends up being a big problem theologically. Yes. We don't know what we know about Jesus is that that's not going to happen. So, mm -hmm. I'm going to attempt to chase down an answer here, and I don't know if the New Testament scholars out there are going to come after me. So nobody turn me in. <laughs> so between you, you guys and me. All right, are we cool? Yes. All right. Good. 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 Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. In Matthew's telling of this story, that is his first answer to her. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. We have to look at the big picture. Jesus is talking about the lost sheep of Israel, which points to the grand plan God had in sending Jesus. We have to remember that he didn't come as some sort of universal figure who was like an alien and just said things in the